Everyone doing good? Rested? Maybe not. Maybe this will change. Good to see you all. I missed you last week. Uh, I was trying to stay warm and dry and fighting off mosquitoes in the wilderness of Algonquin Park, so it was great, uh, but I missed you all. I was with my, my two brothers, a few nephews, and my dad, so it was a good time, but I miss this church. You guys are amazing, so I'm glad that I get to be here. I'm glad I get to preach. Uh, if you don't know me yet, my name is Kevin, as Pastor Nathan said. I get to be an assistant pastor here, which is a great privilege, a great blessing. Uh, yeah, I feel feel very blessed that I get to do what I get to do. So today I get to continue the series that Pastor Nathan kicked off last week. This is our like summer reading series, and we're talking about this book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. Who here enjoyed last week? Good, good. Some people. Who here felt like a little bit convicted and challenged and uncomfortable at last week? Yes. Okay. Pastor Nathan is the only one. That's okay. <laughs> uh, my wife and I, while we were driving back to uh, my hometown, which is where we uh, kind of launched from to camp uh, last Friday, we were driving and we were listening to the audiobook. And like periodically we'd pause it and talk about how we were feeling challenged and slightly convicted and uncomfortable with the content in a really good way, right? Because that's that means that change is happening. That means that transformation is happening. And it's not a comfortable process, but it's good. So I'm excited that we're talking about this, if only for myself. I hope that everyone gets a lot out of this, but for me, it is good. So let's pray together, and then we'll jump right into week two. Today, I'm going to be talking about silence and solitude. So that's, that's today's topic. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for worship just connecting with you. Thank you for this community of people who are going after you. And God, I pray for the rest of our time that you would anoint whatever happens, God, and that people would be changed and transformed, set free from things, God. If you want to use my words, you want to use something totally different, that is all right with me. God, we just ask that you would be very present in everything that happens today, from the message to our fellowship after God. We love you. Amen. Amen. So, uh, for those of you who were not here last week, or for everyone who was and just can't remember what Pastor Nathan talked about, I've been there. It's okay. Uh, let me give you a brief overview of what we're talking about. So, this is the book, right? The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. So we're talking about hurry and the, the epidemic of hurry that exists in our culture today. The stress, the anxiety, feeling overwhelmed. Has anyone ever felt overwhelmed? Yes. Just this past week? Yes. Okay. And there's lots of contributing factors to this culture of hurry and haste and, and stress. Our jobs seem to demand a lot more of our personal time than ever before. We have this temptation to compare our lives with everyone else, right? Especially on social media, but just in the day-to-day. -day. And that can drive us to work ourselves into exhaustion just to keep up with what we, what we see happening in other people's lives. Maybe we, we are very aware that we want to give our kids everything. And so we let them be involved in everything and that ends up causing a whole bunch of busyness and a whole bunch of hurry and a whole bunch of haste. And then there also tends to be this like social status associated with being busy, right? If someone's really busy, often you're like, oh, he must be important or she must be like really, really important because they're so busy. And there's like this weird social status that comes with being really, really busy. And then, of course, we have probably the single greatest culprit of hurry of all time, and that is our devices, right? Our laptops, our tablets, our phones, and they steal away our attention, and they keep them for much longer than I'm sure any of us would like to admit. And they contribute to this culture of hurry. And if we give into this, if we give into this culture of hurry, there's a lot of things that can happen. 
we stop being present in the day-to-day. We stop valuing the people around us, the friends, the family, our spouses. We're less connected with God because we're distracted away from that part of our life. And we sacrifice the here and now for everything else that's going on in our minds, on social media. And then, and then lastly, I think most important is that whenever we live in this state of hurry, we tend to be emotionally exhausted and spiritually we're distant. And so we become very irritable. We become agitated and frustrated. And again, if we feel overwhelmed, you know, the littlest thing can start to set us off. And that's what's at risk if we buy into this culture of hurry. And I'm sure everyone in this room at varying degrees can relate to this, right? You guys can kind of relate to this culture of hurry. And it it pulls at you, right? It's like this, I don't know, whirlpool or something that sucks you in really quickly. But yeah, just just last Friday, uh, like I said, we were uh, driving back to, to Cornwall, which is my hometown. And how many of that, you out there, I want to see some hands on this one. So you're, you're getting ready to leave for a trip, let's say longer than five days. How many of you leave on time? Anyone? No? No? A few people. Okay, well done. Teach me your ways. I do not leave on time. I don't think that we've ever left perfectly on time for a trip that is longer than about five days. Because it's, and just to be abundantly clear, this is not my wife's fault at all, just in case anybody's thinking that not throwing her under the bus, but we're, we're trying to pack up on Friday, and everything is taking way longer than it should. You're like, oh, yeah, I guess we do have to make sure that our, our pet is well taken care of, and oh, we got to, like, mow the grass, and like, oh, we have to pack up all this stuff, and like, make sure we have all the food that we need, and, and it just takes so much time, and I could feel myself last Friday as we're getting ready to go, I could feel myself giving into that hurry, and I was like, no, no, you have to resist this. Because it's so easy to give into that hurry, to give into that haste. And then very quickly that, you know, you get frustrated, you get irritable, and you start snapping at people. So I can relate to this. This is a really good sermon series for me because I feel challenged by this. It's really easy, and it can happen so quickly. We could be having a great day, and then something happens, and everything kind of shifts for us. So it's a real struggle, but there is a solution. There is a solution. Because we we have this culture that's kind of caught up in hurry, this society that likes things fast. But then if you read through the Bible, we have Jesus And he stands in very stark contrast to the society that we live in today. There's like this chaotic swirl of life, and then we read through the Gospels and we see Jesus. And he says, you know, actually Pastor Natalia mentioned it whenever she came up and prayed. He, He invites all who are weary and heavy laden to come to him and have rest. He claims that his commands are not burdensome. He was anointed with joy above all his companions. He's known as the Prince of Peace, the God of all hope. He took longer to do things than the people around him thought he should. He would would take time to do things, and people around him were like, let's get on with it. Why are we taking so long? He was just not in a rush. He was not in a hurry. He had time for children which at the time, you know, children were not considered high, so- high society or high standing. He had time for the outcasts of society, his cultural enemies. He never gave in to external pressure to do anything or to be anyone other than exactly who he was supposed to be. And he did this all while he was on the greatest rescue mission of all time. And I was thinking about this. Have you guys ever heard of the, the idea of having a, uh, like, savior complex where, you know, you're, you kind of just want to save the world? Anytime you hear a problem, you're like, rush in and try to fix it, even if it's not really your responsibility. And I was thinking about how ironic it is that we can get caught up in that, but literally, like, the actual savior of the world didn't seem to be bothered by that at all. Like, there would be a problem... And, you know, sometimes he would respond to it immediately. Sometimes he would take a couple days. He was, not, he was not in a hurry. 
He knew exactly who he was, exactly what he was supposed to do, and he was not affected by all of these external pressures. He stayed confident, relaxed, unhurried, unstressed, and full of peace, joy, and love. Anyone want that life? I want that life. Amen? I want that life. And this is the thing. Jesus invites us into that life. This is not a life that is reserved just for Jesus or like just for pastors or just for monks who take vows and live their lives on a mountainside. Like this is for every single person who is following Jesus. This is the kind of life that Jesus invites us into. And it's not a life without struggle or work, but it's a life without the endless hurry and the exhaustion and like the perpetual just, you know, the grind and it feels like you can never get ahead. And I hope everybody can relate to what I'm saying. You know, this, this nagging sensation, like, there's probably a better way to live life. Like, why do I feel so rushed all of the time? There is. And Jesus shows us how to do it. He opens the door to the life beyond the noise, beyond the clutter, the clamor, the continual striving. So that's what we're talking about. This is all about the ruthless elimination of hurry, getting rid of this hurry, this stress, this anxiety in our lives. But how do we get there, right? So maybe you find yourself and you're like, yeah, honestly, I can relate to that. I feel, you know, exhausted much of the time. I'm tired. I'm stressed out. You know, I'm snapping at my kids or my spouse or my friends or whatever it is. So how do we get from there into a lifelong, day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month rhythm of unhurried and unhasted. So in his book, John Mark Comer is talking about this, and he brings up the verse. We talked about it a couple of times, but I'm going to read it in a second. So it's Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, and this is the invitation from Jesus to all of us. So this is in the ESV translation, which I'm going to be using for all of the verses today. And this is what Jesus says to everyone. Again, this isn't just for people who are, you know, on staff at a church or who seem super spiritual. This is for every single person. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's a good verse. That's a good verse. And so as we're talking about how do we, how do we get to this life that Jesus describes that he lived out, and it's, it's in this verse, we learn from Jesus. We learn from Jesus. And we can learn from the teachings of Jesus, right? The Gospels are filled with his teachings. We have the Sermon on the Mount, and we have all of these other times when Jesus taught. But we can also learn from his lifestyle. In his book, John Mark Comer says this when he's talking about this. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus, And I think this is a really big point because a lot of people, you know, if you really understand the life of Jesus, I don't know a single person on the planet that doesn't want it. Really, if you really understand Jesus, he knew exactly who he was. He had no doubts about his identity or his purpose. He was full of peace and and relaxed. And like, he just, it inside himself, he lived the best life possible. I think every single person wants that. But what we fail to recognize is, that is a result of his lifestyle, the things that he did, the way that he lived his life. And if I can put it this way, if you want the fruit of the the life of Jesus, we have to tend to the garden of his lifestyle. We have to plant the right seeds. We have to do the right things in our lives that are going to yield that fruit. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. So that's what we're going to be talking about today and for the rest of this series, just talking about, okay, what was the lifestyle of Jesus? What were the things that he did? What did he not do? How did he respond to situations? And how can we try to adapt them in our own lives? 
And today, we are starting with silence and solitude, which is something that Jesus practiced quite a bit. So I'm going to give you three examples. I'm going to jump through these pretty quickly. But let's start with Matthew 4, verse 1. And the context of this is that Jesus has just been publicly baptized by John the Baptist. And it's this very public moment. Literally, the heavens open up. And God the Father, like, shouts down, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. That sounds like an epic moment. Has anyone ever heard the audible voice of God? I know a few people probably have. I personally have not. Maybe someday I will. But that would be a huge moment, right? This is like this mountaintop experience. So Jesus, you know, this unhurried man, full of joy, full of peace. What does he do from this mountaintop experience? Well, Matthew 4, verse 1 then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Not what I expected, right? So he didn't go preach to crowds of adoring fans who were lauding him as the Messiah. He didn't go and, like, start healing lepers left and right. He didn't go, like, on a spree of delivering people from demonic oppression or raising people from the dead. No, he just took a walk by himself into the wilderness. And this is what Jesus does over and over again if you see the Gospels. He has moments where he's with people and he's blessing them and he's healing them or, you know, they recognize him in this story. Obviously, everybody there is like, wow, this is crazy. Like, I want to talk to Jesus. And he's like, okay, I'll see you in a month and a bit. I'm going to go off by myself into the wilderness. Silence and solitude. This is what Jesus does. So that's that's our first example. Um, let's jump to Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to look at uh, verses 13 to 14. So in the context of this, so the last, the last passage that we looked at, Jesus was just baptized by John the Baptist. In this passage, Jesus has just found out that this guy, John the Baptist, who also happens to be his cousin, has been killed. Now, that's a big deal. Like, that's, that's a, a lot of loss, a lot of grief. Jesus is mourning, I am sure, in this passage. Like, he's got a lot of stuff going on. And so, in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 14, it says, Now, when Jesus heard this, he heard that John had died, he withdrew, there, uh, withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. Silence and solitude. That's what he's going for. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. And, oh, man, I love Jesus. This is an aside, but I love that in this midst, in the midst of him mourning and grieving, and he, like, wants to be by himself, but the compassion in him just wells up, and it's like he can't help himself. He's like, okay, like, I have a lot of emotions, but you know what? These people, like, I just have so much compassion. I can't help myself. I'm going to bless them. And so he starts healing people. If you read the story, he ends up feeding them miraculously because they're out in the middle of the wilderness, and there's not a Starbucks nearby. There's no McDonald's nearby. So he feeds them miraculously. And then if you skip down to verse 22 of this same chapter, it says, immediately he, Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Silence and solitude. And so I think this, this passage, honestly, is a little bit funny because Jesus is like trying to get away by himself. He kind of fails. And then he's like, okay, I'm going to try it again. I'm going to go up to the mountain by myself to pray. One more quick example. So this one is from Luke 5, verses 15 to 16. And, and this is kind of just a, a quick snippet of Jesus has been doing lots of stuff. He's been healing people. He's been kind of, you know, he's been teaching. He's been doing all of the Jesus things. And in verse 15, Luke says, Now even more the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. 
silence and solitude. And actually, a lot of verses, if you pull it up in your Bible, a lot of translations for verse 16 say often. He would often do this. This is a, this is a regular thing. This wasn't a one-time deal. This was frequent. He would withdraw to desolate places, lonely places, to be alone. So if we want the life of Jesus, if we want this life that's free of the hurry and the stress and the exhaustion, one of the things that we have to adopt into our life is silence and solitude. So let's try to break these things down. I'm going to talk really briefly about what is silence, what is solitude, and then let's, let's try to figure out how do we actually apply this practically to our lives. Again, so that this isn't just a one-time thing. This is a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, year-to-year. We've incorporated this into our lives. So let's talk about silence. Silence itself can kind of be broken up into two different components or dimensions. And we have the external silence and internal silence. So external silence, pretty easy to understand any time that there is not noise around. You don't have your iPhone playing something. You know, your kids aren't screaming at the bathroom door. Um, You know, you don't have a podcast going while you're doing the dishes, something like that. So external silence is this. Pretty easy, right? Not that difficult to get to. You just have to, like, turn things off for a few moments. And we have silence. But then we have internal silence, and that can be a little bit more challenging to get to. And I think it's frequent that we can maybe find external silence, but we don't necessarily have internal silence. For example, you're, you know, maybe you find yourself going for a walk through some nice woods and everything's peaceful and calm, but inside your mind is running a million miles an hour trying to figure out how you're going to pay the bills. Or maybe, you know, you sit down by like a quiet stream and everything's serene, but inside you're like frantically worried about your kids because you're not sure if they're going to be okay. Or you wake up at two o'clock in the morning and everything's quiet. There's not a noise at all, but you're just replaying a conversation in your head over and over again, trying to figure out like how, you know, how do I resolve this relational tension or how do I move on from this moment in my life? And that is the internal noise. It's, it's all the worry that we feel. It's all the, you know, maybe the longings that we have for a life that we're not living right now. It's the criticism over the decisions that we've made or other people have made. The obsessing over whether people might have thought good about us when we did that thing or said that thing. Or maybe they're, they're judging us behind our backs. That's the internal noise. It's kind of that constant inner dialogue. And that can be really tricky to shake sometimes. But real silence that we're talking about this morning is when you have both. So you have the external silence, but also you have internal silence. It's serene. It's hushed. Your mind isn't racing a million miles an hour trying to figure stuff out, trying to analyze things. And ultimately... We want our inner world to be quiet enough that we can hear the voice of God. That still, small voice of God. Because oftentimes, you know, God can do whatever he wants. Sometimes he does very dramatic things to get our attention. Most of the time, he doesn't. Most of the time, it's in the quiet. It's in the stillness. That is where he usually speaks. So that's silence. That's external silence and internal silence. Solitude is basically being alone, but not alone like you're lonely or you're isolated or you're separated from everything, but you're separated to God. It's you and him alone together. And I think maybe it's helpful to kind of think about this as like, you know, if if you're married, it's a getaway with your spouse, and it's just the two of you. Or, you know, if you have a best friend, it's, you know, going for a week-long backpacking adventure, just the two of you. And it's, you're alone, but you're together. 
And that is what solitude is all about. It's being alone with God. I'm curious, how many of you would say, like, the idea of being alone with God is a little bit strange or foreign or at least uncomfortable? Like, that's kind of weird a little bit. Not too many people are raising their hands. I'm not sure if that's because you're afraid to or not, but that's okay. But I think this can be something that feels really uncomfortable. Like, what do I do? What do I say? What am I supposed to, like, you know, talk about with God when it's just me and him alone and we're silent? And I think this is something that in the kind of the wider church culture, I would love to see more normal, that we spend time alone with God in silence, and we actually get really good at just being with him, just being with him. So solitude is not this crazy spiritual discipline, and it's also not this, this thing that, you know, is reserved for the hyper-spiritual. It's just separating yourself from people so that you can be with God. And it's a way to rid yourself of distractions, too. There's not going to be a phone call that's going to pull you away. You know, your coworker isn't going to come over to your cubicle and start bugging you. No pet is going to start scratching at the door, wanting to be let out. It's just you and God. It's just you and God. So this is the invitation. This is kind of the first step on our journey to adopting the lifestyle of Jesus so that we can start to see more of the life of Jesus playing out in our daily lives. Engage with silence and solitude. And there is so much that can happen when we engage with silence and solitude in our lives. And as I was thinking about this, um, I, I guess I could share a lot of stories, but I was remembering this is probably one of the more dramatic moments in my life when it comes to silence and solitude, but this is maybe seven or eight years ago. I was still living in my hometown, hadn't gone to ministry school yet, haven't met my incredible wife, Pastor Kendra, yet, and uh, we had a couple in our church that owned an Airbnb on a lake, and they happened to be extremely generous people, for which I am grateful. And, you know, I was, I was fairly close to them. So at one point, I was just like, hey, can I just borrow your cabin sometime? Like, when it's not already booked, you know, obviously, if it's booked, that's great. But can I just borrow it for a Jesus retreat sometime? And they totally got it. Like, they were like, yep, absolutely. We'll let you know when it's free. And you can just come and hang out. And so I did this a couple of times. Really blessed, obviously, to have people that have a cabin on the lake that I could just go to. Um, but I remember the first time I did this, and again, it was, I, I wouldn't have described it as silence and solitude at the, at the point, but that really was what it was. I wanted to be quiet. I wanted it to be me and Jesus and no one else around, no distractions whatsoever. And so the first time I went there, if I'm honest, I was a little bit frustrated at Jesus um, and so I got there, and I was, you know, kind of processing. I was processing some of my relationship with Jesus. And so I got there, you know, and it was an overnight thing. So, you know, I cooked supper, and I was listening to worship music, read my Bible, did some journaling, all of this stuff. But then the sun started to set, darkness set in, and I just sat by this window overlooking the lake, and I just sat with Jesus and I just let myself express everything I was feeling. And at the time, like I said, I hadn't met my wife yet. And I was kind of frustrated that it was taking so long. Because I was, I was like 25 at the time. And I was like, Jesus, where's my wife? Come on. Like, let's, let's get a move on here. I thought that this would have happened by now. And so I just let myself, like, be very honest with Jesus. You know, this is not how I thought it was going to go. I thought... Somehow I thought by 25, probably would have met my wife yet by now. And so I sat by this window, overlooking the lake, let Jesus know how I felt, and then I just sat there. And it was just quiet. There was solitude. And I honestly, I have no idea how long I sat there. It could have been two minutes. It could have been half an hour. But then I heard God speak. And all he really said was, do you actually trust me? 
And for me, it, it didn't feel like, you know, there was this disappointment or this frustration on God's part. It didn't even really feel like a rebuke. It felt like Jesus saying, I have a better way for you to live life. Do you want it? Do you actually want to trust me? Because if you do, life will be great. If you don't, I'll still be with you and it'll be fine. But do you actually trust me? And I realized in that moment that if I really trust God, it means that I trust him with the timing of this super important thing in my life. And sure, I, I wanted it to happen earlier, but if I truly trust that God has the best plan for my life, which I would have said, yeah, God has the best plan, oh, that means that I need to trust him with the timing of it as well. And so in this moment, I can remember just recommitting myself and being like, oh, yes, Jesus, I trust you. And I can remember saying this in my heart too. Again, I was about 25 and I was like, Jesus, I trust your plan for my life. And if that means that I do not meet my wife until I'm 50 years old, I will trust that that is the best plan for my life. And I'm really grateful it didn't take that long. But it was important for me to say, I do trust you. I do trust you. And even if I don't understand it, and I'll never understand it, I trust you. And I just share that story to say, this is one of the things that can happen when you truly embrace silence and solitude. And it, it doesn't it doesn't always need to be this dramatic. Like I realize you're like, well, I don't necessarily have a friend who has a cabin on a lake that I can just go to. And I get that. I get that, all right? So it doesn't need to be super dramatic. And I'll also say this, it probably won't always feel productive. Like this is a great story. This is a, a major moment in my life. But I have tons of stories where I've tried to do things like this and it, I, it doesn't feel like anything happened. Just a couple months ago, uh, I can't remember exactly when it was, but I, was, I had it in my head that I wanted to drive down to Port Bruce early in the morning and just have some of this, some silence and solitude with Jesus. So I was all excited. I set my alarm for like an hour earlier than normal. I got up, made my coffee, drove down there. You know what happened? I was really, really tired. That's like the only thing that happened. I was sitting there and I was like, I'm exhausted and now I have to start my day. And so I'm driving back from Port Bruce and I was like, did anything happen? Did like, did it work? I don't even know for sure. Like, I'm just really tired. Maybe that was a bad idea. That will happen to you sometimes. And that's okay. And it's, it's not a failure. If we are honestly trying to find silence and solitude with Jesus, that, that is success. So if you're wondering, like, did it work? If you did it, it worked. And you might not always have this moment where it feels amazing and you're connected and everything's great. Sometimes you will, and sometimes you'll have a moment like I had where you're like, I'm not sure why I did that, but you're trying, right? And this is all part of the journey. It's a lifelong journey to get closer to Jesus, to adopt his lifestyle so that we can enjoy the life of Jesus. And it also doesn't need to be, you know, super complicated. If you have a friend who has a cabin on a lake, that's great. But it can be really, really simple to embrace silence and solitude in your life. So as I close this morning, I want to just implore you, do something. Start somewhere. Whatever, whatever stage of the journey you're on, if you're in this room and you're like, I'm not even sure that I believe in Jesus, great. Try silence and solitude with Jesus. I bet he'll show up. And if you've been following him for years and decades, Try something new. Try embracing this in a new way. And I know that in this moment, there's probably excuses rising up inside of you. Because you're like, mm, I don't know. I don't know if I have time to do that. Like, my days are pretty busy. Uh, you know, my kids are in a bunch of stuff. I have responsibilities, all this stuff. And there can be this temptation right now in this room to just dismiss it and be like, no. I don't think that I have time for that. But I want to say that you actually don't have time not to do this. 
You don't have time not to do this. You can't afford not to embrace silence and solitude. Martin Luther, who uh, started the Protestant Reformation and advocated for everyone to have equal access to the life-giving word of God so they could have a personal relationship with Jesus, has been attributed to this quote. I have so much to do that if I didn't spend at least three hours a day in prayer, I would never get it all done. I have so much to do that if I didn't spend at least three hours a day in prayer, I would never get it all done. And I love this quote because I think it, for me, I, I heard this quote, you know, probably 10 years ago and it provoked me at the time and it still kind of makes me feel uncomfortable. And I'm not saying that it, there's a specific time limit, you know, like, oh, I, I only spent 14 minutes with God and not 15, so my day is going to be terrible. I'm not saying that. We're not advocating for that. But all I'm saying is I think we need to readjust our priorities and redefine what success looks like. Because it is possible that you might not get all of your to-dos done if you embrace this. It is possible. Maybe your landscaping won't be like quite as perfect or, you know, you're planning on baking a batch of cookies and that doesn't get done. There's, there's things that might fall off, but wouldn't it be worth it to have a deeper connection with God, to be more present with your friends and your family and your kids, to be more alive to the life that God has gifted you? I think so. I also want to say this, I have a core belief that because God made us, he has the best plan for how we live our lives. And so I want to say, if, if you're in this room and you're feeling like, I don't think that I have time for this, really part of what you're saying is, I have a better idea of how to live my life than Jesus does. Because Jesus invited us into this lifestyle and part of it was silence and solitude. So if we're saying no to that, we're saying, God, I know you made me. Like from the very moment I was conceived, you made me, but I'm pretty sure I have a better idea of how to live life. And you don't. God has the best way for us to live life. And it's not, I feel like oftentimes, um, there can be this, this sense that, you know, you read the Bible and you're like, oh, God has all these rules and regulations and stuff we have to do. And I read the Bible and I say, this is the owner's manual to humankind. Like the owner, the guy who created it, who designed humans, decided to write down, this is the best way to live your life. So I see the Bible and all of these like habits and routines that we're gonna be talking about today and for the rest of this series, this is the, the pathway to the best possible way to live life. This is not, you know, oh, such a heavy thing. This is like, if you want a life-giving life, you go with the person who designed it. And so that's what silence and solitude, that is part of the package. And it might require you to rearrange parts of your life. It might. But I also want to challenge you that it might be a lot simpler than you think. Again, it can be something, you know, super dramatic, an overnight stay at a cabin, that's great. But it can also be really simple and really short. You can get to these things, you can start to build them in your life in really like bite-sized chunks. I used to sometimes use my lunch break at work and I would just go for a walk with Jesus or I'd like find a little room that wasn't being used in my office building and just spend my lunch break there. Maybe it's setting the alarm for just 15 minutes earlier and getting up and being like, I'm not gonna have my phone near me. I'm not gonna have anything else. It's just me and God. Or maybe you need to, you know, with your spouse, trying to figure out the kids and, and maybe ask your spouse, hey, do you mind taking care of the kids for like half an hour on a Saturday morning? I'm just gonna go to the backyard 
and sit with Jesus. Or better yet, maybe offer to do that for your spouse and then, and then ask them to reciprocate. That would probably be a better way to do it. But just try to work it out, right? There's creative ways that we can start to adopt this into our life. And so in this moment, I actually want every single person to decide to do something with this. And, and maybe this is a practice that you've actually cultivated in your life. That's amazing. Let's, let's try something new this week. So I could, you know, I could list off a whole bunch of ideas. I kind of listed a few, but I think that Jesus has the best ideas. He's super creative. He knows exactly where you're at in your life, what's going on in your life. And he's really kind about this too. He's not going to beat you over the head with it, which I'm grateful for. Um, so I'm actually going to give us 30 seconds of silence. And I want you to ask this question, Jesus, what's one way I can practice silence and solitude this week? What's one way? And if he gives you 10, that's great. But let's just start one way. What's one thing I can do? Maybe it's like what, literally one day, like Thursday morning from, you know, this time, whatever it is. But I want to just give a space for you to engage with Jesus and hear him speak into your life. So we'll just take 30 seconds.